close of worship this morning. Revelation 4, verses 6 through 11. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory on, uh, and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, what a glorious day it is that we get to assemble here and a place to meet the country in which we get to do it freely. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of being a part of your kingdom through your grace, mercy, and love, and our obedience to your will. Father, we pray that you'll bless us this morning as we worship. We pray that everything we do and say will give you honor and glory, and we'll praise you to the best of our ability. Father, we have several on our prayer list this morning. We lift up the Peacock family and we lift up the Mullins family as they have lost loved ones and, and their services are coming up soon. And Father, we thank you for so much for the ability to pray. We realize that silence is heaven. It's the incense that is offered. We just pray, Father, that you'll help us to be a more prayerful people. We pray for Sarah and her her health issues for Lynette's granddaughter and for Lynette as she's going to have her hopefully set up procedure to have her pacemaker done <clears throat> for Doc and Flossie's boys and for so many others that need our prayers this morning. We thank you for those who are doing, who have been ill, who are doing better. We pray for Barbara and, and others that need, still need our prayers this morning. Bless us, please, as we worship. We pray that everything we do and say will bring a smile to your face. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Five, 528. 528. Sing it through twice. 528. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 352. 352. 352. Jesus, thy name, my love, all names above Jesus my Lord oh thou art all to me nothing to please I see nothing apart from thee Jesus my Lord Thou blessed Son of God hast bought me with thy blood, Jesus my Lord. How mighty is thy love, all of the things above, love that I daily prove. 
Jesus, my Lord, soon thou wilt come again. I shall be happy then, Jesus, my Lord. Then thine own face I'll see. Then I shall like thee be, then evermore with thee, Jesus, my Lord. 240. 240. Holy Spirit, faithful died, ever near the Christian side. Gently lead us by the hand, pilgrims in a desert land. Weary souls for every rejoice while they hear that sweetest voice. Whispering softly, wanderer, come, follow me, I'll guide thee home. Ever present, truest friend, ever near thine aid to live. Save us not to doubt and fear, groping on in darkness dream. When the storms are raging sore, hearts grow faint and hopes give o'er. Whisper softly, wanderer, come, follow me, I'll guide thee home. 249. 249. How precious is the book divine by inspiration give. Bright as a lamp its precepts shine to guide my soul to hell. Holy book divine, precious treasure mine. Lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. It sweetly cheers my drooping heart in this dark veil of tears. Light to my life it still imparts and quells my rising fears holy book divine precious treasure mine lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home this lamp through all the tedious night of life shall guard my way till I behold the clearer light of an eternal day Holy book divine, precious treasure mine, lamp to my feet and a light to my way to guide me safely home. Would you please mark 262? 262, that will be the song of encouragement after the lesson this morning. 262. Turn to Galatians chapter 6, please. While you're turning to Galatians 6, I will give you uh, an early, well, I don't know if it's an early announcement, but next week is potluck uh, after church on Sunday night, and so make plans to be here for that. It's also Father's Day, and so I'll tell you the joke, then I'll tell you the joke next week, or try to remember to tell you the joke about Abbott and Costello uh, when... Uh, uh, Abbott's trying to explain to Costello about Father's Day. And uh, he said, well, what's his mother going to do? 
And he says, what do you mean by that? He said, well, you said he eats, the horse eats his fodder. And, uh, and, Cobb, and Abbott says, well, yeah, a horse always eats his fodder. And so he says, well, that's pretty rude to dad, all dads, isn't it? All fathers. They were talking about two different things, obviously. In Galatians chapter six, my sister had a classmate. She is a Facebook friend and we see each other not very often, but we see each other from time to time and visit and catch up for a little bit. And there is a routine that Archie Campbell on Hee Haw and a bunch of other routines he ever did. One of my favorite is when he walks into the drugstore and and he asked the the druggist asked, "Would you what could I do for you?" And he said, "I need some talcum powder." And the lady says, "Well, walk right over here, and I'll get you the I'll show you the talcum powder." He said, "Lady, if I could walk over there, I wouldn't need the talcum powder." Or the other one about he walked into a room and this snooty lady goes, "Somebody's deodorant's not working." He says, "Not mine, because I ain't wearing any." So uh, he used to tell the story. And I can't do it like she could, but she could do it so well about the pre-little pigs. It was a play on the three little pigs. And there are a lot of childhood stories that go with that. Obviously, the one that you see the title of the lesson would remind you of Goldilocks and the three bears. We have an affinity for bears. We, we did that through Disney and through animation. It is just like we have an affinity for deer. We have a, a different impression than we did back in the 60s for deer. Deer was food. Deer was meat. And we came along in the 60s, and there's a television or a movie that made deer real sensitive. Well, guess what? We came to three gold, uh, Goldilocks and the three bears, and we have a different affinity for bears. I was in Rio Dosa for a school conference and we were at the old cattle baron. It's not there anymore. And, but we were at the cattle baron and right up, the cattle baron has these three huge electric lines that are in four inch pipe that go up to the top. And all of a sudden, one of our colleagues sees a little cub and the cub's just looking down and we're all, and she says, look, we all look and we start visiting and saying hi to the bear and the little cub. Well, guess what? There's another cub that comes over. And all of a sudden somebody says, I wish I could go up there and pet that thing. And I said, wait a minute. That's where you need to stop. Because mama is real close. And I mean, not two seconds later, she comes around the corner after she hears us saying hi. And like, you keep your distance right there and you stay right there somebody looked at me and said how'd you know that that mama was there and i said oh it was pretty obvious it was too obvious as a matter of fact but there's a, a play on words with what we're going to address this morning and the idea of bearing comes from the greek word bastado in fact the present tense infinitive is bazazate, which simply means to keep on bearing. Just like the Lord bared our burdens on the cross, we need to bear one another's burdens. And we'll talk about that in a second. And Jesus gives that great invitation in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Come learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And John 19, 17 tells us that he bore our burden. Isaiah 53 alludes to that as well. He bore our burden. And we need to understand that the first thing we need to do with each other is we need to bear one another's burdens. Look at verse one and two. Brethren, if a man, if a person is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, lest you consider, lest you 
be tempted yourselves. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, you would suppose that reading that, the church got it. You would read, you would suppose that the church of the 21st century would get that today. But this is the same book in which Peter, Barnabas, and many of the Christian Jews got swept away in an idea to shun, to ostracize, to kick out or withdraw fellowship from, from Gentile Christians because they were a Gentile. And Paul said, and back in chapter two, I withstood Peter to the face because he was to be blamed. You would suppose Peter would have already gotten that message because you remember the vision from Acts chapter 11. But he preached it in Acts 12, excuse me, Acts 15. But he didn't keep it. He didn't hold on to it. I've often wondered who those influential Jews were, the Jewish Christians were, because they must have been awful powerful. Because when you get Barnabas to be in that way, it's Barnabas who brought Paul into the fellowship. Nobody else would do that. Barnabas, called the son of encouragement, was overwhelmed in that doctrine as well. And one of the things that we need to remember and and one of the things we need to keep in mind is that everybody's burdened. I know what Satan's MO is. He gets us to think we're the only one burden. My favorite psalm, and I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm going to tell you anyway, is Psalm 73. Oh, I like a lot of psalms. But my favorite psalm is Psalm 73. When he looks, when the Asaph looks at the world, looks at sinful people, and he sees that they have the better life. They don't have any problems. They don't have any pains. The, the, their sinfulness and their wickedness grows and grows and grows, and when they die, they don't have any pain with that either. And he said, all of us was deceived. All of this was too painful for me until I went into the presence of God and then I understood their end. We need to help each other get there, but we need to do it in the spirit of gentleness. Why? Put yourself in their shoes. One of my favorite songs is by Clint Black. Put yourselves in my shoes. Walk a mile with me. You see, we've got people who don't understand what it's like to be burdened like others. That's great. And I, I applaud that they, they're not arrogant about it. They just don't understand. They're like Will Smith in the, in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, you know, Fresh Prince or Fresh uh, DJ Jazzy Jeff in the Fresh Prince. You know, they, you know, parents just don't understand. They act as though, kids act as though we were never their age. We do understand. We just know what's best. Now, if for some reason you want to hear the song, I'll tell you that after service, but don't do this to me. <laughs> but how would you feel? It's a lot easier when someone bears the burden than you have to bear it alone or someone bears it alone. And what is it that we know from Romans 15, 1? We ought to bear with the, we who are strong, ought to bear with the weaknesses of the weak. We act, though, as sometimes we strong Christians act as though these weak, weak Christians are supposed to be just supermen or, super wo or wonder woman. And they, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get things wrong sometimes, and, boy, we just crucify them. What happened to Apollos in Acts 18? If you watched the search program this morning, you understood well, I'm sorry, if you watch Palm Beach Lakes, I watch so many things in the morning trying to get my mind ready. Sometimes I get it turned around. But David Sproul brought up the fact that in Acts 18, this Apollos, he was mighty, eloquent speaker. He was mighty in scripture. 
But the one thing he got wrong was the baptism of John. No, he knew what it was, but that's all he knew. And when Apollos, or when, the, excuse me, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside, they taught him the more accurate way. For those who say baptism is not essential to salvation, why did, a, why did Priscilla and Aquila turn him, turn him and take him aside and say, here's what you need to do. There's a baptism in Christ where you die to sin, raised to walk that new life. You see, John, the baptism of John was only for repentance. You look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, the same thing. Bearing in mind, bear one another's burdens. And you don't go and exploit them. You don't go and crucify them. There's only one that was crucified. And when we help bear one another's burdens, The burden doesn't get any lighter physically, but spiritually it gets lighter. I was given a trick question one time by someone, and fortunately I knew the answer. Would you rather carry a five-gallon bucket of water or two five-gallon buckets of water? The obvious answer is you would rather carry the one five-gallon bucket of water. It's lighter. It doesn't have as much water in it. But no, the answer is two five-gallon buckets of water. And the reason is you have balance. You have a balance there. The same idea when we help each other spiritually. We help each other balance. Number two, bear your own burden. Oh, now that's not what I was supposed to say. No, I'm supposed to have somebody bear my burden and I'm not supposed to help them, but I'm not supposed to help with my own burden. I want to blow a myth. I want to destroy a myth. The myth, and I preached it at one time, so I'm correcting myself as well. There is a false doctrine out there that says, God will not give you more than you can handle. That is false doctrine. The reason is because there are Christians who are handling a lot more than what we consider more to handle. And the Bible never promised us, as, as Lynn, uh, oh my goodness, I'll think of her name in a minute. Never promised us a rose garden. He never promised that. What he did promise is sufficient help. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 sometime in your own reading. The guy that wrote this asked three times that his thorn in the flesh be removed. That's more than he can handle. But what was God telling him, my grace is sufficient for you. It isn't that God's going to abandon us. No, he's going to help us more and more and more. When Stephen Covey says something in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that is very appropriate here. When you seek first to understand, then to be understood you can help someone. A lot of times we don't do that. We just assume facts, not in evidence. And if the court says overruled or sustained, I mean, why do we not take the time to do that? Does not Romans 12 talk about the church being a body? Every person does its part. First Corinthians 12 goes with that. Paul goes a little bit further in 1 Corinthians 12, one of my favorite parts of the chapter, when he says, can you imagine if the ear says I'm not important? We preachers sometimes think that that's what brethren don't have. Because they'll come up and they'll say, you know what you said? And all of a sudden you're like, when did I say that? Well, I don't know, but I remember you saying it. 
there was a wife that was mad at her husband for a week because of something she dreamed he did. Not he did, she dreamed it. Do you think the ear, and can you imagine what the body would look like if the ear, eyes were here and the ears were here? We'd, we'd go, what? <laughs> We could we could run a good horror films, couldn't we? We could we could make up a real good horror show here. But God put those in place intentionally. How about the foot? The foot says, you know what? I'm not that important because you can't see me. I like what Lloyd Mitchell did. He used to preach in Odessa and he he came and held a meeting for us one time. He says, now this isn't in there, but just picture this. He says, what if the toe said, I'm not important. I'm not as important as the eye. I'm not as important as the hands. I'm not as important. Do you need your toes? Yes, you do. You can tell when somebody has had their toe amputated due to health problems. They walk like this. They don't walk like you and I do. And each part does its part. Proverbs 26, 12 brings us up. You, you need to bear your own burden. You need to bear your own burden. You need to do your part. I need to do my part. This is not an excuse to get out of doing what we, we're supposed to do because a lot of times we concentrate on what we can't do and we forget what we can do. We forget on what we can do and concentrate on what we can't do. I know I'm older, but I caught myself doing this the other day. Christopher, when I got that ladder out, the next thing I know, he was on top of the building before I even knew what was going on. Now, I wanted to, I wanted to put in a practice that Vern and I had. Because I threw him off the roof at next door. Oh, not at our house, but the one next door. We had this informal agreement. If I'm on the building, he's on the ground. If he's on the building, I'm on the ground. But Christopher wouldn't let me do that. He said, no, you got to get up here. Ugh. But he got up there in no time. Me, on the other hand, I'm sitting there trying to be real careful because I fell off the ladder before. He's never fell off the ladder, praise God. And, and I'm trying to be real careful. And I'm sitting there going like, you know what? I ought to just let him do this. I can't do anything. My dad used to do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. My younger brother said, yes, you can, dad. You got the engine off that combine. And I've you ever watched a man who's just so irate with himself and all of a sudden start turning around laughing? I jumped off the tractor wondering what my brother said. And it actually started my dad stop, get to, stop getting this idea that I can't. Sure, there's things we can't do. Sure, there's things that we could do at one time we can't do anymore. That's not the point. What can we do? And a lot of times we just, well, I can't do anything. And every time I say can't, you've heard me say it before, but let me say it again. I have two women. One's dead and in the grave and one's alive. Can't never did nothing. What we need to do is 2 Corinthians 13, 5 is examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. See if we're in the faith or not. Well, how am I going to do that? I'm going to take this book and I'm going to find out. I'm going to look at some things. And surprisingly to you, you will find that, you know what? I'm not as bad as I could be, but I'm not as good as I ought to be. Think about that a minute. I'm not as bad as I could be, but I'm not as good as I should be. In other words, we are always working on ourselves. But oh, how often do we play students? And, and I do this. I'll take a test. You know, I really love tests. <clears throat> But I'll take a test and I don't, for example, I took a government test. That's my favorite subject except the Bible. 
And the question came up, what was our forefathers' philosophy when they established that the president of the United States would be the commander in chief? And one of the choices was civilian supremacy over the military. It was there in bold letters. I couldn't see it. I couldn't find the answer. And out of that test that I'd studied so hard for, I missed it. And I made a 95. Everybody else said, well, you did better than I did. Yeah, but I should have made 100. I should have made 100. I studied for that thing so hard and hard. My friend said, why don't you shut up and just uh, rejoice over the fact that you got a 95 on the test? Duh. I'm not even better than anybody else. Please don't misunderstand that. But what does the Bible talk about in Revelation 22? These are the people who stepped up. These are the people who are celebrating the marriage of the Lamb because they did what God told them to do. And so the third thing is, if you'll skip down to verse 11, is to bear the marks of Christ. And Paul tells us what those are. First of all, spiritual circumcision. You see, in the first century church, the main problem that the Jewish Christians had with the Gentile Christians and vice versa was over this idea of circumcision. And they kept selling the Jewish, the Jewish Christians kept telling the Gentile Christians, you have to be physically circumcised in order to be saved. You have to adopt the rituals of, of the Jewish community. And the Gentiles are like, we never were told that. How could we do that anyway? We're not Jews. And the Jews would look down on the Gentiles and at best tolerate them. That's what the book of Romans teaches. And Paul says circumcision, physical circumcision has nothing to do with this. There is no profit in physical circumcision. There's profit in spiritual circumcision. Paul said it to the, uh, to the Corinthian brethren, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. We're cut off from the world and grafted in, Romans chapter 11, into Christ. We glory in the cross. We know for a fact that the cross is one of the cruxes of Christianity. He took our place. He died. But he wasn't left there. He arose the third day, according to what the scriptures teach, and he has ascended to the right hand of God. And what is he doing? He's living to make intercession for us. I like the way the Hebrew writer put that. He didn't just say he went to the right hand of God to make intercession for us. No, he's ever living. He's eternal living in making intercession for us. The third thing is be a new creature. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we are, not we will be, not we were, not we, well, I was going to say we is, but that's bad English. We are a new creation. How is that? Well, John explains it in 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's the only way we can be righteous. The only way we can be a new creature. And so we need to be the Israel of God. Now I know one of the deceptions that Satan makes today is this. God blessed Israel. And God's chosen people is Israel. That's not true. Let me explain. God's chosen people was Israel. But no longer is the physical nation of Israel 
they're his chosen people. You see, he established a covenant with them. Paul said it was contrary toward us. It condemned us. And since we couldn't hold our end of the bargain, since the Jews couldn't hold their end of the bargain, they couldn't in, they keep the covenant. God took that covenant and he nailed it to something. He nailed it to an an, an object he ailed, nailed it to a symbol that says no longer am I going to write my covenant on the tablets of stone I'm going to write it on the tablets of the heart Jeremiah 31 31 to 34 Hebrews 8 8 to 13 and the covenant people of God is Israel oh no wait a minute you just said a while ago that God no longer chose the physical nation of Israel. And what people believe and are deceived by the devil is, and they won't say it this way, but I'm going to tell you the reality of the teaching. God got so mad at his people that he had a temper tantrum, that he acted like a three-year-old, and so what he did was, is he temporarily, listen to the word temporarily, put in an institution called the church. That that man that Christians believe is the son of God really wasn't the son of God, that the son of God's still coming. And that when he is coming, he is going to dwell in physical Jerusalem when he gets here. And he is going to rule for 1,000 years in Jerusalem. And then the judgment day is going to happen. Now, within that physical 1,000 years, people are going to have children. People are going to get married, have children. But there's only going to be 144,000 Jews that will be present for those 1,000 years because all evil people will have been killed in that seven-year period of tribulation. Now, that last about minute I spoke, that's false doctrine. Because there is not going to be a judgment, which is the predominant teaching of the rapture. The real teaching of the rapture is that there will be no judgment. That they will have killed each other. There will be nobody but righteous people. And my question to them when they teach that to me is, why would God wait 1,007 years to pass the fact that I'm on my way home? That I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in heaven. If he raptures up righteous people to heaven, why is he going to bring them back for 1,000 years and then take them back to heaven? It don't add up. When the Bible teaches in Hebrews 9, 27, that it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment, or the judgment's coming, and God will judge the living and the dead. There's not going to be this seven-year period of tribulation. Not going to be any of that, because this already was happening in the first century. You ever heard of a Roman Empire? You ever heard of a man by the name of Domitian who made Nero look like a baby in comparing? In fact, Domitian died. Let me tell you how bad things were in Rome. Domitian died when his two of his enemies stabbed him in the genitals. And whenever Domitian was dying, he stabbed them back in the genitals. That's how bad things were. And so who is this Israel of God? Look at verse 16. The Israel of God is the church. The church will not die. He, Daniel 2.44, Daniel said, or God said and through Daniel, there's going to be a kingdom that will never be destroyed. That's the church. The congregations may die off. Ephesus did. 
You don't see a congregation in Ephesus today. Remember what happened in Revelation 2? When he addressed the church at Ephesus, you've left your first love. They repented. Don't know how long they repented, but it's not there anymore. The promise was made. If you don't hold them, hold fast to my teachings, you don't hold fast to what I say, I'm going to remove your lampstand. And so God has done that. The church, however, will never die. The reason? The church is going to be finally one day in heaven. Does that mean you're, you and I as members of the Lord's church are not citizens of it? Of course not. We are citizens of heaven. We enjoy heaven on earth, if you will. Why do you think Satan is so active in trying to destroy it? I see, we wear the owner's mark. Who's the owner? The idea Paul's giving here is about a slave and a master. When when I was younger, I didn't know what my dad was doing. We went over to, to a guy, took our cows over to a guy that he had all kinds of stuff. That's the first time I've ever watched a, a guy and his hired hands take and cut bull's horns or cow's horns. Well, what's he doing? Dad says he's cutting horns. I said, what, what for? Well, he didn't want to gore anybody, stab anybody. I thought those cows were going to die. All of a sudden, it hit an artery, and blood just starts spurting out and spurting out. And you know what? The coagulants in that blood just quit. I said, what are we doing now? And I saw this iron piece. And all of a sudden, my dad's brand go right into those cows on their hip. And you hear him going, ah! but they were dads. That's the idea here. We bear the marks of Christ. Look at verse 7, 16, 17. I'm sorry, verse 17. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. What's he talking about here? Well, on one occasion at least, he got 39 stripes. Paul said he had that Five times the Jews got in their mind that if they miscounted, they went over, they were going to die. That was the law. And so they counted 39 times to make sure they didn't go over. He got that five times. That's 195 times that he had a whipping. And 2 Corinthians 12 lists the other, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians 11 lists the other things that he got. But you know what he said in Philippians 3? I consider all of that just rubbish. Because I want to know Christ. Verse 10 through 14. I want to know the power of his sufferings. I want to know the power of his resurrection. You know what Paul's saying in a nutshell? I want to be in Christ so I can go home. I want to be in Christ so I can go home. And so we... Consider bearing, bearing one another's burdens, bearing our burdens and letting the burdens of Christ on us. Because the one promise he's always made is we're never alone. Oh, but how many times have I made the mistake of saying, Lord, I feel so alone. Oh, I felt it. Was I really alone? The answer is no. He's always right there. He's at our side. He's always going to help us. He's always going to do what's best for us. Sometimes we don't like what he says. For example, when we pray for something and he says no. But you know what? It's still good for us. He knows exactly what's good for us. And one of the things that we know is the greatest burden we have is sin. The greatest burden we have is sin. 
And what did he do? He says, I will take that burden and I'll put it on myself. And thus, we have a not burden free, but a burden light life. This morning, if you're here and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, let us know while we sing. I bring my sins to thee, the sins I cannot tell, that all may cleanse it be in thy once open fount. I bring them, Savior, all to thee. The burden is too great for me. The burden is too great for me. I bring my grief to thee. The grief I cannot tell. No word shall need it be. Thou knowest all so well. I bring the sorrow laid on thee, O suffering Savior, all to thee, O suffering Savior, all to thee. I life I bring to thee, I would not be my own, no Savior let me be, thine ever thine alone. My heart, my life, my all I bring, to thee my Savior and my King, to thee my Savior and my King. To help us prepare for the bread, 916. 916. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here, everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here, we in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here, he breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is held. Though unseen, he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing. We'll see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the cup, come share the Lord. And Father, we do look forward to that day. That day when we partake of that of this communion service anew, when we finally live with you, see your face, see the Holy Spirit, and the one who gave himself for us. What an awesome, beautiful, and somewhat scary thought. Because no one's ever seen you before and if they did, they would die. And yet, Father, you have, through your grace and mercy, have made a plan so that we could do that one day. But in the meantime, we thank you that we get to do this every week. 
it baffles our minds that people who claim to love you think that it's okay to do this once every three months, once every six months, once a year. When it's the gift that gives year round. We thank you for the example we follow. When he took that unleavened bread, gave thanks, divided it amongst the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. That's what we intend to do right now, Lord, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Two hundred ninety-two to prepare for the fruit of the vine. Two hundred ninety-two. Two hundred ninety-two. I saw the cross of Jesus when burdened with my sin. I sought the cross of Jesus to give me peace within. I brought my soul to Jesus, he cleansed it in his blood. And in the cross of Jesus, I found found my peace with God. I love the cross of Jesus. It tells me what I am. A vile and creature saved only through the Lamb. No righteousness nor merit, no beauty can I plead. Yet in the cross of Jesus, my title there I read. I trust the cross of Jesus in every trying hour. My sure and certain refuge, my never-failing tower. In every fear and conflict, I more than conquer am. Living, I'm safe for dying through Christ the risen Lamb. Um, safe in the cross of Jesus, there let my weary heart He'll rest in peace unshaken till with him ne'er to part. And then strains of glory I'll sing his wondrous power. Where sin can never enter and death is known no more. And Father, we thank you that death will not have the last word. It will be the last enemy to be destroyed. But Father, that wasn't possible without Jesus coming, living and dying, resurrecting and going back to you. What a plan. What a mighty good plan. But we are sorry what it cost you because of our sins. And when Jesus took that cup, and he took that cup of redemption and handed it out to the disciples. He said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. This do in remembrance of me. We are so grateful, Father. And we intend to do this right now in remembrance of him. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Nine hundred seventy seven.
977. In heavenly armor, the bomb. I'm oh, sorry, let's try that again. In heavenly armor, we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. Lord. When the hour of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The power belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses and hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, and strength to the Lord. Father, what a blessed honor it's been to be in your presence today. We pray that you have felt the same being in with us today. Father, it's an honor and privilege to be one of your children. We don't always live the way you want us to, and we ask you forgive us. Father, we pray for all of those that are listed in the bulletin and pray for others that we don't know about. Father, there's so many that are sick, so many that are not doing well. You know who they are. But we pray for those who are spiritually ill as well. There are so many. Most of our world is so spiritually sick and spiritually dead that we can see the way they behave, that is their fruits, and Father, we pray that we can be used some way to influence them for you. That they can be yours before it's eternally too late. Bless us, please, as we go home. Bring us back when we're supposed to be back. I thank you for everyone who is here who's tuning in. And I pray for those who weren't as lucky as us today. Please forgive us of our sins, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here this morning.